Hello and welcome to Roundtable. As winter approaches across Europe, COVID cases are on the rise again. 15 countries reporting infection increases over two consecutive weeks. And that is the first sustained rise seen across the region since the wave of the most recent variant, BA5. But this season always brings another infectious threat with it, the flu. Could these now combine to unleash what some people are already calling a winter twindemic? Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. In the United Kingdom, tens of millions of people are being urged to get flu and COVID vaccines to ward off a serious public health risk. UK health security agency officials are anticipating a surge in influenza infections in coming months and are concerned that it will coincide with the wave of coronavirus cases already building up. How prepared are health authorities across Europe for protecting their most vulnerable citizens. OK, time to broaden the discussion. In London, we have Jeremy Brown, Professor of Respiratory Infection at University College London. Also in the UK capital, Rebecca Wallersteiner, health journalist who spent time in a cardiac unit at the start of the pandemic. And we go to Stockholm. Eduardo Corsani is their group leader of coronavirus and influenza at the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, which you know perhaps better as the ECDC. Um, Jeremy, let me come to you first of all. A couple of quick medical questions. Can you get flu and COVID at the same time? Yes, no, you'd be this unlucky to do so, but you can. We know that viral infections are often co-infections, about 10%, I think the statistics say, in general, that you may have flu and another virus, and that could be COVID, could be rhinovirus or RSV. But the same could have applied in the previous two and a half to three years, couldn't it? Well, he could have done, but there wasn't much flu circulating, so the chance of catching it was very, very small indeed. But okay, so, so year, why is flu be... a real danger now? Well, there's, there's there's two main reasons. One is that we've had two years with very little flu circulating, so the general immune response from the population, the immunity to the flu, has been weakened by lack of exposure to flu. Uh, and two, we don't have the sort of lockdown and the social distancing measures that we had, uh, not necessarily that much last year, but certainly the year before. So we've got a potential chance of a resurgence of flu. And we know that's happened in Australia because they, they sort of, they're ahead of the game. They have their flu um, problem in our summer, which is their winter, and they've had a bad flu uh, epidemic this year. And, and from what I understand, and reading this just as a, as a layman, what happens in Australia, what happens in the Southern Hemisphere is then transferred perhaps to the north when we come to our winter. So we have to learn from them what kind of vaccination to prepare. Are we there? Yes, yes, exactly. The vaccine, um, the decision about which, vac which strains to include in the vaccine has been made. The vaccine uh, fortunately matched what was occurring in Australia. So the flu um, strain that was circulating in Australia and causing most of the outbreak is very closely matched to the, to the strain that we're using in our vaccine in the Northern Hemisphere. OK, so we're as prepared as we can be, as long as we have enough staff in the hospital. We'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. Eduardo, you, you are a public health doctor. I know you don't want to commentate on your specific home country, Italy, which was very badly hit at the moment, but to talk about this from the European-wide perspective, in terms of vaccine preparedness for both flu and COVID, and in terms of personal protective equipment, how much better prepared is Europe now than it was two and a half, three years ago? Well, of course, the experience of the pandemic have brought more preparedness. And uh, of course, uh, there have been a lot of efforts in order to be able to provide supply and to be ready when, uh, when waves of different respiratory viruses, in particular COVID, but now also influenza may be coming. Therefore, I think there is a, a better overall preparedness in this sense because of the very recent experience that uh, hit uh, Europe pretty badly. Which is going to kill more people, COVID or influenza? This is, a, this is a, a difficult to predict, but of course uh, it depends on several factors. 
So COVID-19, uh, we've known it, but we also know that the population immunity have grown over time thanks to the vaccination and also to, to the infection that a uh, that big part of the population experienced. So we are not naive anymore to the virus. Nevertheless, it's still quite an important disease, and especially in the risk groups, it can still cause a lot of damage. We don't know if there will be a new variant anytime soon. We're going to go through the at-risk groups in just a moment. So let me just ask you this one uh, final question before I come to you, Rebecca. If you are as unlucky as you can be, and 10% uh, is the figure, according to Jeremy, who get both flu and COVID at the same time, what is the morbidity rate for that? What is the expected morbidity rate? Well, I, I don't have figures for that, but I, I would like to say one thing, that... What we saw last year and what we saw this summer in Australia is pointing in the direction that maybe at the population level, it is not so likely to observe a peak of influenza infections and COVID infection at the same time simultaneously. Maybe this is due to some viral interference, but uh, we observed it last year when influenza was peaking, COVID-19 was not. And when we had Omicron in early uh, 2022, influenza went down. So we had a very unusual season with two peaks of influenza. Okay, well, you, you, you then give, give me a, a question that pops straight into my head. Um, does that mean that influenza viruses and COVID viruses were fighting one another? They couldn't exist together. And if so, which one is stronger, and likely to win? It's not about strength. It's about uh, being able to occupy the, the niche in that moment. So as we know also from the past, the respiratory viruses, they tend to come sometimes in different times. So they, they compete probably between each other and sometimes one of the two is prevailing over the other. So more than seeing one annihilating the other is more likely that we will have uh, or we may observe waves coming at different times. This was clear in Australia when BA5 came, which is the Omicron subvariant, influenza plummeted. There was an early peak of influenza in Australia, followed by then a wave of BA5. And last year, likewise, when we had a, a wave of influenza before Christmas, then Omicron came, influenza went down, and then when when uh, when the Omicron BA1, BA2 started to go down, influenza came back up. OK, so, so, so let me come to Rebecca. I, I don't want to just leave her sitting there wondering when we're going to talk to her. Um, it doesn't sound likely, therefore, does it? If, if these are being very polite viruses and one is saying, after you, and then the other one is saying, no, no, after you, and they're waiting for one another to go through their general routines, it doesn't seem likely um, that there's going to be a twindemic, as some people have suggested. Uh, it's been fascinating hearing these two experts talk, and they obviously have a world of knowledge behind them. Um, I think it's very difficult to know, to predict what's going to happen. Um, as at the moment, I think most of the variants seem to be Omicron, um, but there could be a new variant arising. I think it's very unlikely we're going to have a pandemic of flu and Omicron at the same time. But I, I bow to these two experts with such a multitude of knowledge behind them. Therefore, you wouldn't want to say, because you wouldn't want to exaggerate it, that people have been um, pushing this idea and engendering fear unnecessarily. We just don't know. Well, 15 years ago, I, I worked as Dr Thomas Stutterford's whole team at The Times for 10 years. And we used to have lunch with Professor Oxford, who was the world's influenza expert. And he said it was only a matter of time before we ha would have an epidemic um, on 1918 to 1920 standards, which killed millions of people worldwide. So who knows? I hope it doesn't happen during our lifetime. That was the one called the Spanish flu, because I think that was the country from which it was first reported, not because that was the country that started it. Um, have, we had, it was, it was... have we had that endemic, that pandemic, with what we've seen with COVID-19? Or are you suggesting perhaps that uh, what Professor Oxford was saying is that worse could follow? No, I think we're still, it's still, um, we're still waiting for it. Um, that the 1918-21 flu killed many million people, multi-million worldwide. So I think that didn't quite happen with COVID, although the figures were terrible. OK, Jeremy, it's a bit like that old Jaws promo, isn't it? Just, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. We're, he we're hearing Rebecca saying that uh, what we've seen up till now could be nothing compared to what's coming. 
I mean, the most surprising thing about the COVID pandemic is that it was COVID rather than flu. We were all expecting a pandemic at some point, and pretty much everyone was probably expecting it to be a version of flu, not a version of uh, coronavirus. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the flu pandemic that could occur has not occurred as yet and could occur in the future, certainly. OK, well, that, that worries me, and we'll come to that in just a second. I mentioned we go through the high-risk groups, adults over 65, those with chronic health conditions that's such as asthma, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, a kidney disease, pregnant women, uh, people with immune compromised systems, HIV and AIDS, and young children, cancer patients and survivors. If you don't have the flu jab, and many people are fed up with having any kind of vaccination, if you don't have the flu jab, and I have to confess, I'm 67. I have never had a flu jab and I'm still prevaricating. Are we much more likely to have the flu pandemic to which you refer or a COVID pandemic? Or, or, or if I have the jab, is it going to go away? Right. So when you vaccinate, you vaccinate to protect the person receiving the vaccine, but also to prevent sort of transmission. And with flu, most of the transmission comes from the children. We're vaccinating the, the children widely. So there that will prevent the tr most of the transmission that occurs or so vaccinating an an adult really it's for their own protection and if you're a healthy 25 year old then that's not really necessary i suppose your firm might take the idea that actually you know vaccinating is a good idea because if they do that they will reduce the absenteeism due to sick people people being sick and, and many firms do this they actually pay for their employees to be vaccinated simply because it's work it's cost effective for them uh, if you are 67 i'm afraid to say david that i would have the vaccine if i was you especially if you've got some degree of comorbidity uh, I know, high blood pressure or diabetes or, or whatever um, i would have the vaccine because it would reduce the chance of you ending up in hospital due to a destabilization of whatever underlying condition you have not just the flu itself but the flu will make you your whatever diseases you may have worse. OK, can do. So I, I, I get that. But the original point I was trying to make is if I have the flu jab, and I'm, I'm mm. still sort of 50-50 on that, is it more or less likely or will it make no difference to whether we have the flu pandemic to which you and uh, Rebecca have referred? OK, so the vaccinating of the children is the, the main thing that we're doing to stop the spread of flu being... Uh, as rapid and as high as it could be. So an adult, no, not really. OK, so it'll make no difference just just, just, just to me and my peace of mind and my family's peace of mind and my health. Thank you. Um, Eduardo, let me come to you. Take a look at this. Uh, this is from your lot, European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. 15 countries in Europe reporting a rise in COVID cases, one of those being the UK. Um, the highest infection rates, and I'll get to the UK figures in just a moment, the highest infection rates, Austria, France, Germany, Latvia and Liechtenstein. Because you have to, to look, if you like, at the actuarial reasons why this has happened, do those countries have anything in, in common? I, I don't think it's... A, in, I mean, in terms of epidemiology, we are observing, like, an increase that is happening in COVID in general. So after, after a period, after the, the wave during the summer, where uh, there was a quiet period in the recent weeks, now we are seeing, in general, an increase in numbers. These numbers are based on the tests that are currently carried out. And this may also depend on the amount of tests carried out in a said country and the policies, the testing policies that are in place. So I would not focus too much on the specific countries that are reporting. OK, so they don't necessarily have anything in common, because I was wondering, I mean, Latvia is Eastern Europe, but the others are all Central European, Austria, France, Germany, borders between those two, Liechtenstein, I'm afraid my geography is not absolutely up to scratch, but pretty much involved in, in that lot. It's not necessarily the fact that people are going backwards and forwards between these countries in a way that they weren't two years ago. No, diseases are spread between individuals, not between countries. And I think this is also a perception that during the pandemic was very common. But unless a country is quite isolated from the others, I think the problem is more that we see a general trend now that is starting again a new potential wave of, of infection that is kind of expected, actually, because we are getting into the autumn and, and, the, and the winter. So it's not surprising per se after a period of calm. So 
if we see COVID in the last two years, it's gone in waves continuously. So after a period of relatively calm, there is a period with a, with a new uh, wave of infection. The question is what will be the impact of this new wave of infection if it's coming and whether there will be a new variant at some point emerging with which, with which characteristics that will then define the impact. Have a think about this. How do you think, and I won't ask you now because I want to get back to Rebecca, how do you think various European health services are coordinating um, their response if this happens? How, how well set up are they now compared to other times? But Rebecca, I want to take a look, if we can, at a little graph here. This is the UK. Uh, infections up 14% in one week. But if you take a look at the end of it, um, it's only just over a million, whereas in July it was 3.7 million. Um, in March it was 4.9 or just under 5 million. Do you think we're getting a bit worried for no reason, just because the weather's about to turn? My personal view is that it, it's much as you would expect going into the autumn. You'd therefore, therefore we are perhaps button. panicking a little bit? Um, the experts may disagree with me, but at the moment it seems to be Omicron, Omicron variants. So I think at the moment there's, there is not much to worry about, but this may be different in a few months' time. OK. You were at Hammersmith Hospital when all this kicked off. Um, I know you're a journalist, but you were also involved in helping to run a, a major unit, the cardiology surgery unit. You were manager of, of that. How frightening was it not necessarily from a personal health point of view, but from a systemic point of view to see how easily the system was unable to cope at that particular point? Um, well, I think there was never a stage where I, where I didn't feel the system was coping. I think people did a fantastic job. Many people put their lives on the line. Um, people I knew died. Um, so I just think they, they were able to cope far better than one would expect. And is that because of peculiarities in the unit where you were working or do you think perhaps it was written up that other services were getting overwhelmed perhaps unnecessarily? I can only speak from my own experience. Okay, Jeremy, what about you? Respiratory Sorry. professor, UCL member of the UK's Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. Uh, you've been on that now for four plus years. Um, are we prepared now if we get kicked again? Well, yes. I mean, uh, repair, we've got the vaccine, it's being rolled out and things. The the big issue now is that with these waves of infection, and we've had three this year so far, and I think the fourth one's going to be coming over the next couple of months by the look of the data. It's hard to be sure, but that's what it looks like it's going. The trouble about those, those peaks of infection is that it ends up causing more admissions to hospital. And now each individual who's admitted to hospital, actually about two thirds are admitted with Omicron or the uh, COVID rather than because of, but that in itself causes stresses and strains because you have to isolate them. You can't keep them in general wards because they might pass the, the virus on to other people who are more susceptible and who, and who will get ill if they catch it. Because by definition, the hospital is full of people who are susceptible to coronavirus. So it just the the strain on the system of uh, managing all the extra patients who need to be isolated from each other the issue of the medical staff going off sick because they've got um infection with coronavirus and i think 10 percent was the absenteeism due to infection earlier this year it it just adds an extra layer of strain on the nhs which is already you know, frankly it's it's hard work at the moment it, we're struggling yeah i'm sure it is susan hopkins eduardo let me come to you Actually, let me finish with you, Jeremy, on this one. Uh, if we all have flu and COVID jabs this winter, those of us that need flu jabs, uh, will there, or can you say for certain that there won't be a problem? No, I think there still will be a problem. It's a question of how much of a problem. Uh, the, you know, the vaccines really are to, I mean, it helps an individual by preventing infection, but from the sort of the 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 health of the nation perspective, the idea of vaccinating as many people as possible who are at risk is to reduce the strain on the NHS and the admissions that should otherwise be, would not occur um, because, you, because of COVID and influenza. So if you can prevent those admissions, you will make the whole system work a lot better. OK, like driving a car with an airbag in a sense. You know, it, it's not there so that you can crash, it's there in case you do crash. Uh, Susan Hopkins, Eduardo, Chief Medical Advisor at the UK Health Security Agency. This is part of what she had to say recently, and we've heard 
it pointed out that lower levels of natural immunity due to less exposure over the last three winters and an increase in COVID-19 circulating with lots of variants that can evade the immune response. That's her quote, but she sees this as a problem. Tell me about variants. Before I came to research this program, I hadn't heard of BA5. I'd only heard of Omicron. I know that there are other variants that you might be concerned about. Are they already out there? Are there those that look more virulent? Uh, tell me about where we're going now with, with different types of COVID-19. Yes, so since we had Omicron at the beginning of the year, then we had a series of what we can call subvariants of the Omicron variant that we called the BA1, BA2, up to the BA5 and others. Some caused some waves, some uh, luckily did not. And this was also mainly based on their characteristics and their competition with each other. Now, at the moment, BA5 in Europe is the, by far still the dominant variant. We have over 98% of the sequences that are BA5, and that, that uh, is quite stable since a while. Of course, uh, this can change, and we, we are monitoring the situation, and we may observe sometime in the future new variants replacing the current one. Okay. Uh, oh, is, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, carry on. No, no, the question is about the characteristics of the, of the new variants, of okay. course. Okay, which leads that me to this. More or less leads me to this, if you don't mind. Um, let's say you've got a garage with 10 different cars in it, each one of those producing a particular type of vehicle. Let's say each one of those is an Omic uh, a, a COVID variant, and you've got your Omicron, you've got your Delta, you've got your Kent, you've got your South African, you've, you've, you've got so many of them. Was there one of those initial variants that actually cause more problems, and therefore, if it mutates, it's likely to be of more consequence, unfortunately, than the others. Tell us what we should watch out for. I think it's not as easy as that, because it's always an interplay between our immune system and the variant. And we are putting pressure on the variants to change based on our immunity. At the beginning, the main winning factor for a variant over the others was the transmissibility, the, the speed at which it could uh, replicate and then be transmitted. Then gradually, with our immunity at the population level growing over time, then it became more competitive for the variants to be able to evade our immune responses, at least at the level of the infection, not necessarily at the level of getting severely ill, because the aim of the virus is just to re replicate and spread. It doesn't aim necessarily to kill us. So in this sense, I think at this stage, we can expect uh, the, let's say, if we want to use this term, the winning variants or the new potential variants may have a more immune escape profile compared to, to the ones that we observed in the past, while originally it was more variants with more transmissibility and, and, and they were able to replicate. Have some of them gone that. away? I mean, they, they go the others who were more fit, it's a matter of fitness and evolution between them. And when a new variant that is more fit in that moment, based on its characteristics, it tends to replace the previous ones. Rebecca, we had this from an infectious disease specialist in, in Tennessee, the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital there, Dr. Richard Webby. We should be worried. I don't necessarily think it's run for the hills worried, but we need to be worried. Bearing in mind what all three of you have said, and the two medical doctors in particular, are we already learning to live with this? I think in the past two years, um, it's almost become normal to live with COVID. Um, so we, you know, we, we've been we're prepared because we've had two years of experience of dealing with the pressures relating from this. And, and is that the way that it's going to be from now on? We, COVID is effectively sidelined, it's serious. Uh, influenza is sidelined, but it's, it's, it's treatable and it, and it is preventable if you get the right vaccine. Is, is this the way we're going to go, that we have to wait now for something new to come up? Your thoughts, Rebecca, and then, then you, Jeremy. Um, I'm afraid I'm an optimist. In um, the 1918-21 flu, it came back every year, but eventually it became weaker and it became just like a cold or a normal flu. But... Um, I bow to the experts on this. OK, Jeremy, are we waiting for some virus, some complaint lurking behind the door in the dark uh, for us to open the door and get hit over the head 
when COVID's in the hallway, actually is just sitting back and relaxing? Uh, okay. I mean, uh, the thing about COVID is it's, it's basically established itself now. We are, it's going to be around. It's going to be causing problems for a while yet. Um, and it's, it's integrated into to medicine now as part of the, the, the rich tapestry of respiratory problems that we have to deal with. Um, but it is an extra illness over what we had before 2020. So it's, it's an ongoing extra additional stress and strain on, on clinical services. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the programme. Stay safe, stay well, stay optimistic. Thank you for uh, joining us on Roundtable, Jeremy, Rebecca and Eduardo. Thank you for watching this edition of Roundtable. Take every care, every precaution. And I am still thinking about that flu jab. I think it seems more likely now than it was at the start of this half an hour. For me, David Foster, until next time, goodbye.